It is a great honor to be here because I appreciate so much what R.C. Sproul and Ligonier Ministries represent for the cause of Christ. I believe as the history of evangelicalism in America is written, one of the seminal marks of the 20th century will be the influence of Dr. R.C. Sproul and of Ligonier Ministries in arming the saints, equipping the saints for the work of ministry and recovering among American evangelicals that lost knowledge and wisdom of our doctrine, of our heritage, of our confessions, and of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It is also a high honor to be here with the other speakers who have been and will be on this platform. And as I come before you this afternoon, I come reminded of the one with whom I expected to speak who is not here but has gone to glory. When I think of Dr. Boyce, I can hear the refrain by Martin Luther, the body they may kill, God's word abideth still. What a testimony he left us, and how appropriate it would be that this conference continue to declare what he declared in the inerrant and infallible word of God. These days, we are told increasingly that the Bible that God's truth, that the gospel itself is offensive. And most remarkably, there are those who would tell us that this is a new problem. That here, as we arrive at the end of the 20th century, all of the sudden the gospel has become offensive. Now, how might the Apostle Paul respond to this? Not only does this reflect the tyranny of the contemporary, it also gives us one more painful indication of the superficiality of evangelicalism in our day. Why we are surprised when the gospel is offensive to the world, when those who hate God and hate God's truth and are His enemies hate also the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ, His Son. Evangelicalism today is marked by full churches with too many empty pulpits too much empty preaching, so many words, the volume of which is remarkable. The weight, however, is so light. We see the abandonment of the gospel, in some cases by outright accommodation, in others by the substitution of another gospel, in other churches and denominations and institutions by repackaging and marketing, in many cases by sheer cowardice. It is such a strange idea that the gospel is newly offensive. Writing to the church at Corinth, Paul said that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ, is foolishness to Greeks and a stumbling block to Jews. Those patterns of response are as old as Jesus in the incarnation faced those who rejected him, not because they misunderstood what he said, but precisely because they heard his words, they saw his deeds, they understood his claim, and they rejected it. Many churches and denominations, many institutions that would call themselves Christian are obviously ashamed of the gospel. Well, what would it mean to be ashamed of the gospel? How would we understand a pattern of shame in response to the gospel? Well, what better evidence could we have than the abandonment of the gospel for something else and for something less? What else could we have as clear evidence but the cowardice before the world that is evidenced by so many Christians and so many churches? Writing to the church at Rome, in chapter 1 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Not ashamed. It's interesting that he asserted this truth and claim in the negative, is it not? He wanted to make emphatically clear that we are to be unashamed of the gospel and that he, whether writing to the church at Rome or the church at Corinth or the church throughout the world, was unashamed of the gospel. As a matter of fact, that is the defining mark of authentic Christianity. It is found in those who are unashamed of the gospel and unashamed to present the cause and the claims of Christ, the gospel itself. Today's culture is hostile to any claim to truth. 
And the Christian gospel is the ultimate claim to truth, dealing not only with our origins but with our destiny, giving us the clearest word about who we are and about our deepest problem, which is not a lack of self-esteem but sin. And the fact that our hearts from our birth are at enmity with God. We face in this day new challenges and new contexts, but we face a very old reality. It is the enduring reality of the times between the times until the church triumphant shall become, excuse me, till the church militant shall become the church triumphant. I would direct your attention this afternoon to the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 6, a remarkable passage in which we see the very pattern of those who are ashamed of the gospel. We think back earlier in John chapter 6. As this chapter begins, we find the feeding of the 5,000, that incredible miracle whereby 5,000 men and unnumbered women and children were fed out of one little lad's meal two fishes and five loaves. When you get to verse 14, after being told that when the excess was gathered up, it filled 12 baskets. In verse 14, therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Immediately thereafter, Jesus walks on the water and he retires, recuses himself from the crowd. He goes to the other side of the lake. And when we come to verse 26 of John chapter 6, the people have found him again. In verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Verse 26, Jesus answered in to them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Well, it's interesting we should note that we find seekers in this verse. And Jesus tells them that what they are seeking is not what should be sought. Jesus answers them directly at the issue of their motivation. He says, I, I want you to know that I'm on to you. You did not come all the way over here to find me with such determination because you were looking for salvation. You came because you want to see another sign, because you're looking for another miracle, because yesterday there was the feeding of 5,000 and the multiplication of bread. You come looking for more bread. Verse 27, Jesus said, Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Just as speaking of water and living water in John chapter 4, Jesus addressed the woman at the well, so here Jesus addresses those who sought him in this way, and he says, You have come for the wrong reason, but since you are here, I want to tell you, you should seek something higher. You should not seek the food that perishes, but the food that endures to eternal life. Notice verse 28, a characteristically human response. Having observed this miracle and seeking another they did not hear Jesus' word and the rebuke and exhortation that was in it. They continue their argument. They said, therefore, they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? That is the question being asked by many persons even within the church, is it not? What must we do to work the works of God? Jesus answered to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. What can I do to be found right with God? What can I do to accomplish my salvation? What can I do in order to get God's attention? What can I do that God would love me? What can I do that I might have everlasting life? How does Jesus answer? The work you are to work is to believe in him whom he has sent. How is that work accomplished? Of course, by the Holy Spirit in regenerating the dead unto life. We are given the gift of faith, and here the Lord Jesus himself said, it is faith and faith alone that saves. In verse 30, they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? 
what work do you perform? Well, it's one thing to hear you make this claim, and it's very interesting to hear this theological observation, but we would really like to see another sign, because another sign would add authentication. It would add a little weight to your argument, Jesus. It would, it would be very persuasive. And by the way, if you were thinking of a sign, we might give you a little hint in verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus, it would be wonderful if we had another one of those bread miracles. Uh, if we're going to ask for a miracle, we might as well be specific. After all, name it and claim it. We want the miracle about bread. And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven. A little theological correction here, by the way. They were thankful to Moses for the bread, and Jesus said, by the way, it wasn't Moses who gave it to you. It was my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven, for the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. The manna was a sign. The manna was a symbol. The man appointed to Jesus Christ, he is not that manna that falls day by day to keep the children of Israel alive. He is that manna, the very bread of life, as he will say, who came that we might have life everlasting. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. They didn't know what they were asking for. In verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. One of the great ego e me, I am statements found in the Gospel of John. Jesus uses this language very self-consciously and directly in order to make clear his deity and to define that deity to the people. He here says, I am the bread of life. And in subsequent verses, he will play this out and let us know what it means that he is the bread of life. It is a picture of his atonement. It is a picture of his provision for us. It is also a graphic demonstration of the substitutionary character of the atonement. He did for us what we could not do. He died on the cross for our sins. He shed his blood so that all the Father gives him will come to him. He has paid the price. He was our substitute. Jesus in verse 36 changes the theme, the spirit here just a bit. He says, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. He has said in verse 35, He who believes in me will never thirst. He who comes to me will not hunger. But here I am, and you do not come. You do not believe. Continuing on, Jesus describes what it means to be the bread of life, but here he interrupts that in order to give us a theology lesson to which we had better pay very, very careful attention. It relates to what we have been discussing in terms of worship and the approach the church should take to the proclamation of the gospel. Look to verse 37. It is one of two axioms found within this passage, two axioms that are offensive to the modern mind, that are offensive to the modern world, and that are clearly offensive to many who call themselves Christians. This is the word of the Lord in verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Shall we notice here there is no parenthesis, there is no footnote, there is no codicil, there is no qualification whatsoever. The atonement of Jesus Christ is accomplished. It will be seen in eternity to have been fully accomplished. Nothing will be left undone. All the Father gives me. Here we see a wonderful testimony to the sovereignty of God in salvation. It is pictured here as the Father giving the purchased possession to the Son. The promise comes without qualification. The one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Jesus continues here. Remember that axiom. He said, I have not come down from heaven... Excuse me, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. 
For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. Now, what is the response to this kind of preaching? Well, it comes very quickly. Therefore, the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. Well, there are many in the church and in leadership today who would tell us that when grumbling is the result of our preaching, something has been wrong with our approach. Why, there should be universal consensus. There should be a spirit of absolute, unquestioning acceptance of everything that is said. That isn't what took place here. Jesus said, you are looking for bread. I am the bread of life, and he who believes in me will never hunger, will never thirst, will receive everlasting life, and still you do not believe. And the Jews here were grumbling. They were disputing because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. We are given... The absolute language of their grumbling in verse 42, they were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 37, the first axiom, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Like an opposing bookend, completing the set, in verse 44 we read, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. We better remember this in preaching the gospel. Martin Luther instructed his students to remember that in the preaching of the gospel and in the preaching of the word, it was their responsibility with faithfulness and accuracy and integrity and precision to get the word to the ear. But only the Holy Spirit can get the word from the ear to the heart. That is not our prerogative. We are not able to bring the dead to life. That is only accomplished by the Holy Spirit of God. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. He continued in verse 45, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. In verse 48, in pristine clarity, in just these few words, he says again, I am the bread of life. And since you brought up the issue of the manna, I'm going to return to it. He says in verse 40, 49, Your fathers, by the way, ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. Not one of them is here. The manna was pointing to me. When you receive me, you will never die. You will have eternal life. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, there are certainly those who would suggest that Jesus is not following a, uh, a very good model of postmodern preaching. There's absolutely no easy ramp of introduction to this sermon. There are no pithy illustrations, no real life stories simply a reference to the prophets, the example of the manna, and the clear, unvarnished proclamation of the truth that he is the bread of life. The salvation is found in him and in him alone. Well, we've seen that there was already a pattern of grumbling, and now as Jesus has extended his presentation, the grumbling has been amplified. We turn to verse 52, and we find then the Jews began to argue with one another. We've gone from mere grumbling to an active disputation that is taking place. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus, hearing this, said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you... Now, you'll notice here that Jesus does not back off. He presses the point. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. And then John tells us that he said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Several lessons to be learned from this presentation of the gospel. Jesus takes them when they came and they sought bread and he says, you're looking for the wrong kind of bread. I am the bread of life. You have come looking for the wrong kind of sign. I am the one whom God has sent. You came because you wanted your stomachs filled. You wanted your imagination tickled. You wanted your wishes fulfilled. I came in order that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Well, all of that is prologue. In verse 60, we are told something absolutely amazing. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? See, our, our mind has been and our imagination has been directed upon Jesus speaking these words and upon the Jews who are grumbling and then arguing with one another. We really haven't even been thinking about the disciples, those who had identified with Jesus. And we are reminded that John speaks of the twelve and then he will speak of the larger group of disciples, far larger in number that have been traveling with Jesus and, and walking with Jesus and had associated with Jesus and claimed to be his disciples. And we are told here in verse 60 that they were offended. As the text says clearly, the disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? We can also, as we see this text... Imagine the faces of these disciples as Jesus was speaking. We hadn't thought of them before, but now the text directs us to them. Jesus is speaking about being the bread of life and is making it clear that those who refuse to eat his flesh and drink his blood have no life in them. And these disciples must have been sending each other some askance glances, muttering under their breath, did he say what I thought he just said? Did you hear that? Oh, this is tough. This is awkward. Just wait till this gets back to Jerusalem. We think we have a public relations problem now. You just wait till the Jerusalem Post gets a hold of this. And why does he have to lay it on so thick? I mean, he knows who they are. He knows what they expect. Can he just kind of dole it out slowly? Can't we retranslate this? I mean, it's pretty graphic. Blood, flesh, bread. Certainly there's a metaphor he could have used that's a, a little less graphic than this. These are the disciples of Jesus that are complaining. We've not, we're not talking here about the Jews who opposed him and had already rejected him. We're talking about the disciples that said they were his followers. In verse 61, sovereignly, Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? Jesus had to turn to his own disciples, knowing in his heart the fact that they were grumbling, and, and he turns to them and asks a question that is so chilling, it seems as though all the air must have been evacuated from the atmosphere. He turns to them and he says, does this offend you? Does this offend you? When I speak of myself as the bread of life, when I make clear the fact that I have come as the one whom God has sent, when I make clear the fact that salvation is found by believing in me and salvation is found through my atoning sacrifice and my substitutionary atonement alone and salvation comes by this means and this means alone is God's gift in this way and this way alone, does this offend you? 
Well, as we began this afternoon, it clearly offends many because this isn't what we hear. There's clear evidence this is offensive because there are so many churches that never, ever get to the positive proclamation of the gospel, this gospel. And there is no other gospel that is the gospel. In verse 62, Jesus amplifies his point. He says, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? That rhetorical question seems to have a twofold meaning. First of all, it at the gut level means if you've got a problem now, buckle your seat belts because there's far more coming. At another level, he's saying, if you find it difficult to hear my teaching, what are you going to do when you observe its accomplishment? Jesus explains in verse 63, and the faithful church must hear these words and hear them carefully, and the church in this generation must, must hear them very self-consciously and carefully. It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Two opposing principles described here, the flesh and the Spirit, and Jesus said it's the Spirit that gives life and the flesh profits nothing. He didn't say the flesh is insufficient. He didn't say the flesh is inadequate. He didn't say the flesh is not quite up to the challenge. He says the flesh profits nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, what do we have in writ large evangelicalism today but an attempt to reach persons through the flesh? to try to manipulate the flesh and to try to guide the flesh and to try to give the flesh what the flesh demands, bread. Instead of preaching, Jesus Christ is the bread of life. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life, but there are some of you who do not Believe Some of you who do not believe, he said, to those who were his disciples, who claimed to be his disciples, who had associated with him. They had joined the movement, so to speak, but they were inauthentic disciples. They had not believed with a heart. They did not believe. And Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe. And John tells us, lest we miss the point, he knew who it was who would betray him. Now in verse 65, Jesus goes back to what he had said earlier. As you look to verse 65, compare it to verse 44, he said to his disciples, he said, in case you missed the point, that's what I was talking about back there. Now you see the evidence. For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. In this text, you will find particular redemption. In this text, you will find effectual calling. In this text, you will find the totality of the vision of the gospel that Jesus is demonstrating here, whereby we understand that it is God's means whereby He has saved sinners and calls them to Himself through His Son. No one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. That's tough, isn't it? And it's true. It's tough because in our modern mind, we've got salesmanship written all over us. And we want to think there's something we can do, there is some program we can arrange, there's some technique we can develop that will eventually be universally applicable and effective. I mean, the preaching of the gospel seems to offend even as it draws. Maybe with a little marketing savvy, we could uh, better the odds, increase the margin. And after all, all that it requires is the abandonment of the gospel. The intensity grows significantly now in the text. In verse 66, we are told that as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. They left. They went out from us because they were not of us. A church that is unwilling to have people leave for the right reason is no church. 
In verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, you do not also want to go away, do you? Do you also want to go away? Well, here we have the clear evidence there are those who said they were with us, they walked with us, they supped with us, they worked with us, and now in the face of the gospel, they've left. Jesus turns to his own, to the twelve, those whom he had chosen, and he turns to them and says, do you also? want to go away? If we can feel the near terror of Jesus asking that question the first time to the larger group, just imagine the intensity it must have meant for Jesus to turn to his own in this painful and excruciating encounter and turn to them and say, are you going to? Are you also going to go away? I believe that this is the church at the end of the 20th century, faced with the same question. I believe that Jesus Christ is asking this question of us, even as he asked it of the twelve, will we also go away? In light of the pristine clarity of the gospel, will we also depart? Unfortunately, we see that pattern around us. I want to speak of several specific departures. First, the false gospel of psychotherapy. This gospel is tough. It is extremely tough. It's so tough there are those who will look for anything else, and what they will look for is something that will give an ointment to the conscience, something that, as Paul said to Timothy, will tickle the ear. These days we are being told that our most basic problem is a lack of self-esteem or a pattern of codependency or the fact that there's a lack of authenticity within us. We are out of touch with the inner self, with the inner child and niece and nephew and grandchildren and all the rest. And what we desperately need to do is to get in touch with ourselves and feel good about ourselves. I'm okay. You're okay. Jesus is a OK. That's as much gospel as you will hear in some sectors. How about the whole category of Christian self help books? I mean, first of all, that's an oxymoron if ever there was one. If you could help yourself, save the money, don't buy the book. But the gospel isn't about self help. It's about a unilateral salvation accomplished by Jesus Christ. It isn't about what Jesus Christ does adding to what we have done. It is about the fact that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And we bear by the grace of God and by the accomplished sacrifice of Jesus Christ the imputed righteousness of God's own Son. It is a substitution for our unrighteousness, as He was our substitute on the cross. This false gospel of psychotherapy is found rampant throughout the church. It is found even in churches that would not recognize it and perhaps never even made a self-conscious decision to move in this direction. It is found in the very air we breathe and it comes out in the language we use. It does have its egregious examples. I would speak of a pastor who is on television and uh, is very popular and should not be named, who preaches under a great deal of glass. And he said, in his words, that sin is a fundamental lack of self-esteem that inhibits the full development of the human personality. I want to take you back with me to the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. And the serpent, who no doubt was a qualified and certified psychotherapist, <laughs> came unto Eve, who had made her appointment, and having heard her self-expression, said, uh, Sweetheart, I want to tell you what you really need. You really need more self-esteem. No, what actually happened? The serpent, who was wiser than any of the creatures, came unto Eve and at the conclusion of that dialogue said, if you take this fruit, the reason God doesn't want you to eat it is because when you eat it, you will be as He is. You'll be as wise as God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And it wasn't a lack of self-esteem that led to the fall in Genesis chapter 3. It was a, a damnable surplus of self-esteem. 
Everything is described in terms of the psychotherapeutic language. Philip Reif said that every culture has a great symbol. The symbol of the medieval world was a, a cathedral because the one thing men knew is that they must be right with God. And he said in the modern world of especially the 18th and the 19th centuries, he said that the great issue, the great symbol was the House of Congress or the House of Parliament because the one thing we knew is that we must order our society justly. And he said when we come to our day, the great symbol is the hospital because the only thing we really know about ourselves is that we are sick. And we will try to make ourselves well. The problem with the gospel of psychotherapy is that it tells us our problem is internal and that we are out of touch and have become enemies to our real selves when the gospel is that we are enemies of God. It is not a lack of self-esteem, but a surplus of self-esteem. It is not that we think too lowly of ourselves, but that we have thought too highly of ourselves. We have shaken our fists in the face of our Creator and said, I want my way, and we have been born in sin and our sin is upon us. The false gospel of psychotherapy preaches salvation through pharmaceuticals, through therapeutic techniques, and through sheer interiority, just getting in touch with ourselves. The second false issue is the false gospel of social activism. Evangelicals are born activists. We always want to go do something, and, and there's something glorious in that, but there's also something very dangerous in that because the gospel can very quickly be translated into something it is not, and that is a social action plan. The social gospel was not just a problem among liberals at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. It is a problem among us. Now, certainly, we must be faithful to what the Scripture tells us about the demands of, of justice and about our responsibility to the least of these, but to translate that into the gospel is to preach another gospel. Now, it is certainly true that to fail to demonstrate Obedience to Christ's commands here is to show ourselves to be disobedient disciples. But there are others involved in social activism. And that does not mean that is the gospel. They are preaching a false gospel. The third of these false gospels is political activism. And evangelicals were fairly immune to this temptation until recent decades. When many evangelicals now feel that what we need to bring about a just society and what we need to bring righteousness before our nation is to mobilize a mighty army of voters who will go out and accomplish God's purposes and we will legislate the gospel. Well, certainly there is a demand and certainly there is a command and we must look at every political issue and every vote in terms of our stewardship as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, but always as citizens of a kingdom higher than any earthly kingdom. It's interesting to notice this debate now as it has taken shape with Cal Thomas and Ed Henson in the book they have recently written. Cal Thomas said, it's high time evangelicals come to understand that national revival is not going to come riding in on Air Force One. Well, it certainly is not. Nor is it true that we are to seek to withdraw from the entire political equation. I would say this, evangelicals had better reach a point of theological maturity where they are bereft of any notions that revival is going to come riding in on Air Force One no matter who is on it. But with humble stewardship, we must say that our vote is a matter of accountability. It does matter who is on it. With the Apostle Paul, we should have humble expectations of government, and we should understand that that is not the gospel. Our vote, our political activism, should certainly be formed and impacted and shaped and directed by the Word of God as we are faithful disciples living by that Word. But our purpose as the church is not to preach a gospel of political activism, and we must take care in this generation lest it appear that that is our point no matter what we say. 
we must make clear that the issue is the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our concern is not so much with citizens, but with sinners in need of a Savior. Fourth, the false gospel of theological revisionism. This has been with us from the beginning. It was right here in John chapter 6. There were those disciples who said, you know, I think if, if we just bring in the right consultant, we could get a better spin on this thing. Some of this language is so hard and so harsh and so particular and so demanding, certainly we could come up with something a little smoother than this. We could package it and we could have an introductory section and we can establish a point of contact and uh, we, can, we can build some affinity with the movement. That's a start. And uh, after we get a little affinity with the movement, then we can start some directional advertising and some marketing towards deeper issues in order to bring them to where we want them. And oh yes, by the way, where was it we wanted them? Theological revisionism is as old as the Garden of Eden with the serpent saying to Eve, hath God said. You look across the landscape of America's theological institutions, you look at the mainstream of American theological education, you look at what is being poured out of the publishing houses, you look at the last 200 years, and it is nothing in the main but a tragic abandonment of the gospel. A self-conscious attack upon the truth of God's Word. There are blessed exception, but what we see largely around us are the ruins of institutions established upon the gospel, with that gospel long since abandoned. Virtually every Christian doctrine has been accommodated in our day. The substitutionary atonement is being thrown out. The entire penal understanding of the atonement is grotesque and outdated and medieval. Total depravity, which Chesterton said is the one empirically verifiable doctrine, has been thrown out because they didn't understand it, and once they understood it, they hated it. Total depravity tells us we're dead, and we deserve to be. Total depravity tells us that there is no good in us. There is no part of us untouched by sin, and we hate it. The sinner hates to be told of his sinfulness. God's providence has been ruled out, and now we're being told that chaos theory is the way that the entire universe is managed, and uh, one of the metaphors much loved by those who are addicted to chaos theory is that there's a butterfly somewhere off of Japan that flutters its little wings and it sets off indeterminate patterns in the atmosphere that builds up into cyclonic force, and eventually you have El Nino or El Nina across North America, and that little butterfly who never intended to bring drought to the Great Plains has done so. I want to ask you how, can you, how do you live in a world like that? I mean, can you imagine the sheer terror? I mean, if you live that out consistently and you really believe that were true, can you imagine what you would do every time you saw a bee buzzing somewhere? You know, there goes Thailand. I don't know what you do. But the idea that there's a sovereign God who created the world out of nothing, ex nihilo, is the theater of his own glory and rules over it all as its sovereign king, that is absolutely outruled by the modern world. And there are many Christians who say it is simply out of date, that's old-fashioned, even if it is in the Bible. The Trinity? Well, there are many seminaries today that will tell you the Trinity is just an outdated doctrine whereby we see the radical and unfortunate influence of Hellenistic philosophy. Biblical authority and inspiration, you know that story. This gets right down to doctrines such as election, the doctrine of hell. Hell has been so redefined in our day that as one observer said, modern-day Americans have air-conditioned hell. And it's unlikely, many believe, that anyone's going there anyway. All of this, and especially now we see the culmination as the sad pattern of decline continues with the development among some who call themselves evangelical of open theism. I want to say, even though this will be offensive to many, 
and certainly to those who have given themselves to this position, those who hold to the openness of God are no evangelicals. I fear they are not even theists. Their God is a God of ad hoc sovereignty. Now just imagine that colossus of an oxymoron. A God with plan B for when plan A doesn't work out. A God who knows, as they say, all things that can be known, but there are some things even God cannot be known because they do not yet exist to be known. I don't think that's what King David believed in the Psalms. I don't think that's what Jeremiah understood in his call. I, I don't think that's what's demonstrated in Scripture. But they say God can't know some things because they are not there to be known. However, we are told in Scripture that God knows all things, past, present, and future, including even the, the decisions made by His creatures in the future. He knows from eternity all things. He is a God who is never surprised. His purposes are never thwarted. Just ask Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. He'll give you the testimony. I have come to know who is God, he said, and his hand can never be stopped, and his will is always accomplished. David Brooks has written a fascinating new book entitled Bobos in Paradise. And you may never have heard of a bobo before, but it's a bourgeois bohemian. And uh, it, it, it hits especially hard at baby boomers, and I am one, so I can say that. The children of the 60s that have grown up and uh, still wear the sandals but uh, drive a BMW, they've given over to the system. And they're trying to live these awkward lives with the values of the 60s and the material success of the 90s. And the, so they're bourgeois bohemians. That's what they want. But in spiritual life, David Brooks says very suggestively, they have adopted a policy and a worldview of flexidoxy. Their only orthodoxy is a flexidoxy. Whatever it takes, whatever. You just put it up. It's, a, it's a, a, a homemade chemistry set. You just take it home, open it up, put whatever you want together, and it's going to make something beautiful. It's going to make something explosive. That's what it's going to make. In this morning's Wall Street Journal, there is an op-ed piece about the fact that InterVarsity Christian Fellowship has been banned from several campuses because they will not allow homosexuals into leadership posts. Naomi Schaefer asked the larger question, what does this mean about uh, the freedom of religion? What does this mean about openness on America's campuses? What does this mean about the larger issues of the gospel at stake? She says this, speaking of the lack of openness on America's campuses, and I quote, but that kind of openness is not enough, that kind of openness being that all persons are allowed to attend the meetings and to hear the message, but they're not necessarily allowed into leadership. That kind of openness is not enough for the non-judgmental ethos of today's campuses. Of course, most campus groups discriminate in some way or other. Baseball teams don't include paraplegics. Campus newspapers don't have to publish bad writers, and there are very few tone-deaf sopranos in college choruses. But religious groups are treated differently. Why? Because for many students and administrators, religion is just a menu of beliefs among which one can pick and choose the personally meaningful ones. It isn't as rigorous as baseball. Well, that's where we are. We see the great worldview clash. When we talk about upsetting the world, I want to give you a promise. When you preach the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to upset the world. The world is going to respond in anger and indignation and is going to cry intolerance when you speak of the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the, the world is going to cry unacceptable when you say that salvation is by the act of a sovereign God alone and in the way and by the means He alone has accomplished and provided. And when you say that salvation is by grace through faith alone, you're going to be told that's too restrictive in the multicultural, postmodern, relativistic culture of America today. I want to promise you that where the gospel is preached, there will be not only those who respond by the gift of faith and show evidence of regeneration and claim Christ as their Savior, there will be those who will respond with anger and opposition and rejection and indignation and sometimes just superficial dismissal. 
I want to take you to the encounter between Jesus and the rich young ruler. In shorthand, we might just call him a yuppie, a rising young executive. He was rich, and he was young, and he was a ruler. This was a young guy who was going places. He had a lot of potential, and just imagine the connections in that Rolodex. He comes before Jesus, and in, he sees Jesus instructing the crowd, and here he is with his elitist type A personality, an upwardly mobile, ambitious young man. He says, well, you know, I've been listening to you talk to the crowd, to the hoi polloi, and uh, that's one thing, but what must I do to inherit everlasting life? And Jesus says, all right, hotshot. What about the commandments? And with sheer insolence, this young man says, well, I've... Uh, I've kept them all, never broke a one of them. And of course, in saying that, he did it. And Jesus is going to demonstrate to him the error of his ways and the false analysis of his condition. And Jesus says, all right, uh, uh, young executive, Mr. Self-Sufficiency, upwardly mobile, what can I do to be saved? Sell all you have. Get rid of the car, the condo the house, the boat, the yacht, the golf club membership, the clothes, get rid of it all. Then come back and talk to me about how you haven't broken one of the commandments. Well, we're told what happened. The, the young man went away. Sad, but he went away. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father draws him to me. But can you imagine how hard that was for the disciples? Palestinian fishermen, poor. Time and time again in the Gospels, we see that the disciples are tempted to think of the Gospel in terms of what they can do to build a movement. And they certainly must have looked at this rich young ruler in a different way. I, I can speak as a Baptist. I know what would happen if a Baptist preacher treated someone this way. His deacons would come up to him and say, preacher, look out in that parking lot. Lots of Yugos and Chevrolets and Fords. Not many Mercedes. We could have used him. He could have been a tither. And you know what? We could have reached an entire generation through that young man. He has connections. He went away sad. And Jesus let him go. And the disciples saw it happen. I wonder if evangelicals in this generation are willing to answer the question Jesus asked with faithfulness. Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? In verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's where it all ends. There's only one answer we can give when the question comes to us from Jesus Christ, will you also go away? Our answer, our only answer, the only faithful answer is that given by Peter here in this classic text. The humble question, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life, and not only that, we've come to understand that you are eternal life. We have come to understand that you are the Holy One of God. You are the Messiah, just as in Matthew chapter 16, he gives the same kind of confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the one we've been waiting for. Now we understand that you are the bread of life, and we are yours. Evangelical Christians in America at the end of the 20th century are standing in this same Galilean spot where the disciples then stood, and the question comes with the same intensity to us as it came to them, will we also go away? Let us pray not. It is in God's sovereign hands. Let us pray that God will glorify Himself in the preservation of His people. May we stand by the gospel. May we be unashamed of the gospel. And through us, may the gospel upset the world. Amen.